Welcome back to Department 1. People versus Robert Durst, Mr. Durst is present with Mr. Chesnoff and Mr. DeGarren, Mr. Lewin, Mr. Milius, Mr. Bailey and Mr. Henderson, Mr. Miata are here for the people. Mr. Lewis is also present, though not in the room. And uh, sorry for the delay. We had uh, had some technical problems. We had to bring in a specialist in flip charts to. <laughs> no, no, no. It was actually the electronic uh, system that need, that was uh, on the fritz and needed some attention. So I uh, regret that uh, delay. But we are now ready to go. So um, our witness, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, has resumed the witness stand. I'll remind you that you're under oath. And you may continue with your examination, Mr. Chesnoff. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Dr. Loftus. Good, good morning, Mr. Chesnoff. I, I did get permission to take the mask off during the testimony. Of, okay, that's great. From the judge, then, yes. I would like to uh, further discuss some points regarding false memories and the three phases of memories that you described yesterday before we get into some hypotheticals. Can you please explain again for the jury what a false memory is? A false memory is when someone reports or thinks they remember something different from the way it actually was, or it can even be an entire false memory for something that didn't happen. Can you please explain to the jury generally what can cause false memories? False memories can be caused uh, by external suggestion. Uh, if there is uh, some source outside the individual uh, person who uh, mentions something that is misleading or erroneous in some way uh, in a conversation, that can lead a person to have a false memory. Um, people get false memories when they're interrogated in suggestive or leading ways or if they're exposed to uh, biased uh, media coverage that uh, insinuates things that may not be true. Uh, these are opportunities uh, for new information to enter a witness's awareness and lead them to uh, remember something that is false. Can you tell the jury, please, what factors can affect the, what you described as the acquisition phase? Well, there, at, at the time of some event itself, um, th there are some obvious factors like, uh, you know, how good is, uh, is the lighting or how far away is the person or how, how uh, many distractions there may be. Um, but so those are, are some acquisition factors that can affect the formation of a memory in the first place, or, or whether a person is paying attention, um, because attention is w one of the important ingredients in storing something into memory in the first place. Can you explain to the jury what factors can affect the retention phase? Uh, well, certainly the passage of time. Uh, as I testified yesterday, uh, memory is fading over time, uh, and as it's fading, as it's becoming weaker and weaker with the passage of time, it becomes more and more vulnerable to post-event uh, suggestion. And then can you also tell the court and the jury what factors can affect the retrieval phase? At the time of retrieval, there are other factors that come into play. How are questions asked? Are the questions uh, leading uh, or are they neutral? Um, those are some of the things that can affect what a witness retrieves uh, in the retrieval phase. Can you explain to the jury whether a person's opinion of the speaker, their opinion of their veracity, whether they exaggerate, whether they're known for telling wild stories, can impact the acquisition, retention, and retrieval phase? Well, if, if, if you're getting information from somebody that um, 
may not be that trustworthy. It, m it might affect the amount of attention that you pay to the information, and if you're not paying as much attention uh, because of this factor, you might not store as, as complete a memory. Uh, it's also the case that if you get post-event suggestion f from a trustworthy source versus an untrustworthy one, you're more likely to accept it. So there are a number of ways in which the, if you want to call it the trustworthiness or perceived trustworthiness of the source might affect um, what people remember. Can you please tell us what post-event inf post information is, post-event information? Uh, uh, hoping I'm not too redundant, post-event information is new information that becomes available to someone after some key event. I think you used it yesterday or may have been something I read, but you used the word malleable yesterday. Can you explain what you meant by uh, how a memory is malleable and what malleable actually means? Our, our memories are malleable, which means that they, they're not fixed. It's not like a recording device that you can then play back later, but rather these, our memories are subject to contamination, distortion, or change. And that's why we talk about the malleable nature of memory. And I think I've even written a, a paper with, with that title, The Malleability of Memory. Um, it's also true that confidence is malleable. And, and as I may have testified uh, yesterday, um, if you give someone reinforcement for a memory, you can make them more confident in it, or if you uh, give them um, a, a reasons to, uh, to doubt their memory, you can make them less confident. So confidence, too, is malleable. Thank you, Doctor. Now, taking into account what you've testified to yesterday and today, I'm going to present some hypotheticals for you and like you, like you to uh, answer questions about the hypothetical. I want you to assume a dean of a medical school provides a statement to law enforcement in 1982 that he received a call from a certain student and that he was expecting to receive the call. I want you to further assume the dean was interviewed by the police shortly after the call. I want you to assume the dean reports that the phone call was several minutes long and the student stated she could not attend her clerkship that day and that she described several symptoms of illness. I want you to assume over the years that the dean is interviewed several times and maintains this account. I want you to then assume that years after the reported call that the dean is questioned by law enforcement and the prosecution, to recall the conversation and to recall whether he really spoke to the person on the call in 1982 and whether it could be a different person. Please also assume that the law enforcement and the prosecution caused the dean to question the identity of the caller. Do the factors that you've discussed with us and the research you have done and the literature have any relevance in explaining that hypothetical or how would you react to that hypothetical? I think the, the scientific uh, literature on memory does have relevance to that, that situation. Um, there's some event that occurred. Uh, there's a very, very, very long uh, retention interval. Uh, the individual in the hypothetical recalls the information soon after the event when it's most likely to be accurate, continues to recall the information that way, and if years and years later somebody uh, presents some disconfirming suggestion, it can m make somebody less confident about that very old memory. Can you explain to the jury what post-identification feedback is? Yes, post-identification feedback is a, a term that usually refers to a situation where Somebody has seen an event and then tries to identify a particular person who might have been seen before. In a typical situation, there's a crime, there's a suspect, and there's an attempt to identify the person who was seen before. After an identification is made, 
people can be asked about how certain are you, and, and they might say, you know, I'm, I'm fairly certain or whatever. If you give them feedback after they make that retrieval, if you say, uh, that's what other people are saying, or we have other evidence that supports that, it will artificially inflate the person's confidence. Or, or if you give them disconfirming feedback, it will reduce the confidence. That's what post-identification feedback uh, refers to. And it's usually discussed in the context of an identification. I'm assuming that there have been studies and research done in this area? Uh, yes, many studies of, of post-identification uh, post feedback. Um, probably 20 years worth of studies um, pioneered by uh, one of the leading um, eyewitness memory researchers, uh, Gary Wells and his collaborators. And where is Gary Wells a professor? Yes, he's a, he's a very prominent researcher at uh, Iowa State University in the psychology department. Okay, I'm gonna move to another hypothetical. I want you to assume that there is a young girl who is approximately 14 years old when her father's significant other is killed. She does not provide any specific information about a particular conversation to law enforcement when she is first interviewed. When she is first interviewed by police after the killing. We need to approach. Okay. You may approach. <clears throat> Doctor, I'm going to start all over. I want to present another hypothetical. I want you to assume that there is a young lady whose uh, father's significant other is killed in 2000. She does not provide any specific information about a particular conversation to law enforcement when she is first interviewed by the police after the killing. May we approach briefly again because this issue. Your Honor, I leave it to you. No, but we can take care of it going forward. Speaking objection. It's not a speaking yeah. objection, Dick. I'm asking if we can. Yeah, let's go sidebar you. before you say more. <sighs> All right. Three times a charm. Yep, let's oh, try again. <laughs> she does not provide any specific information about a particular conversation to law enforcement when she is first interviewed by the police after the killing. I want you to further assume that someone from a movie production represents to her that there is information suggesting a theory that her father's significant other help provide an alibi for a friend. The person becomes further aware of this theory after being exposed to external information. I want you to then assume that over 15 years after the 2000 killing, the witness provides a statement to the prosecution that she recalls that when she was 13, her father's significant other told her that she had provided an alibi for a person. Please assume that this alleged memory was not previously reported in prior interviews and the person admits their memory was foggy. I want you to further assume that approximately five years later, the girl provides an even more detailed account of her conversation and includes other details including location of the conversation and other specific details. I want you to assume that the district attorney also prepared with the witness before the testimony in an unrecorded session. Do the factors you've discussed with us and the research you have done have any relevance to that hypothetical? Yes. Please explain. Uh, well, again, with reference to uh, this uh, diagram, 
uh, there is an event that occurs in this hypothetical, um, a possible a possible conversation. Um, there's a long period of time. There are multiple uh, examples of post-event suggestion um, in the hypothetical coming from an interview, coming from other sources, and that's the kind of post-event suggestion that can get people to think that they are remembering something that was merely suggested to them. And if there's further, further, you know, pressure, even subtle pressure to remember more, many people will elaborate on that suggested information and, and, and make it more detailed, e even if it's false. Okay, moving to another hypothetical. Assume that a woman is a close friend of a person who dies in 2000. I want you to assume the woman provides a statement to the police in 2000 but it does not include references to a certain conversation from nearly 20 years prior while the woman is allegedly in a, in a beauty salon. I want you to assume that the woman only mentions certain alleged events approximately 15 years later when being interviewed by the prosecution. Specifically, I want you to assume that in 2015, the woman recalls for the first time an alleged telephone call that she had with her friend in 1982, and that she recalls her friend telling her about a certain alleged incident. I want you to assume that in relaying that story for the first time, the woman is not confident in her story, and that she wishes she could be hypnotized, and that she's confused if the friend actually said these things. I want you to also assume that later, when providing additional statements, the woman is more confident and the woman believes that her memory is now better. Do the factors you've discussed with us and the research you have done have any relevance to that hypothetical? Yes. Please explain to the jury. Uh, again, you have a situation where there is a supposed event uh, that occurs decades ago, a, a very, very long retention interval. Uh, and it, a presentation of some suggestive information that could affect the retrieval. Uh, and in this hypothetical, it, it appears there's also an, uh, an instance of, of confidence inflation where the confidence in the, in the memory um, goes from questionable, memory is foggy, need to be hypnotized, to now more confident. And so th that confidence inflation could be due to that um, post-event information and suggestion. Moving to another hypothetical. I want you to assume that a woman is a friend of a person who was killed in 2000. I want you to further assume that over 15 years after the friend is killed, the woman watches a movie related to alleged events related in part to the friend's killing. Specifically, I want you to also assume that the woman has watched a movie which suggests a story theory that her friend assisted another person in a cover-up. I want you to assume that the friend was interviewed for a movie by movie producers. I want you to also assume that the woman then later tells the prosecutors that she recalled an alleged conversation with her friend over 30 years before. I want you to assume that the woman reported this information to the prosecutors after being filmed in the movie. I want you to also assume that the woman also later stated to prosecutors during her interviews years later, I'm trying to remember this very carefully because it was a really long time ago and it's hard for me to distinguish it all from what I've learned subsequently. I want you to assume the person later admits that she might have been conflating two different periods of time during her recollection of events. Do the factors you've discussed with us and the research have any relevance to that hypothetical and explain why? Uh, yes, yes they do. Uh, and again, we've got a, a, a situation where there's, there's a very, very long retention interval, uh, decades of a retention interval. There is the presence of uh, suggestive information um, and so 
the potential is there for that suggestive information from the interviews um, from the film to contaminate or distort uh, this uh, hypothetical individual's memory. Um, what is very wise about this individual is the recognition um, that often is missing in people. Some pe people are often not aware that their memories can be contaminated by post-event suggestion, and so it is um, somewhat impressive that this person is recognizing that that is a potential in, in her case. I want you to assume that a woman is a friend of a person killed in 2000. Over 16 years later, the friend speaks with a news reporter where she reports that over 34 years earlier, she had a conversation with her friend where alleged statements were made. I want you to assume that the statement was made to a news reporter. I want you to also assume that the woman's statements are included in a news article. Further assume that the woman reads the article and then subsequently speaks with prosecutors and law enforcement. I want you to assume that when the person speaks with the prosecutor about the statement, that the prosecutor suggests that the statement, quote, well, I don't have to say quote, I'm sorry, I withdraw that, that the statement doesn't sound like a good thing that she did. After she stated earlier in the interview that she didn't know whether the alleged statement was related to something good or bad. Do the factors you've discussed and the research that you've done in the studying of this area of the law, uh, area of science, I'm sorry, have any relevance to that hypothetical? Yes, and at the risk of being redundant, again, you have a situation where there's an extraordinarily long retention interval with examples of post-event suggestion, and it's the kind of post-event suggestion that can supplement or contaminate uh, somebody's memory. Assume a woman is a friend of a woman who's killed in 2000. I want you to assume the woman had known her since 1976. I want you to assume that the friends both move apart and have less frequent contact. I want you to assume the woman spoke with her friend a short time before her death. I want you to assume the woman had a prior history of drug usage, including marijuana, on a regular basis for many, many years, and further harder drug use until 35 years old. I want you to assume that the woman provides a statement to police and does not mention anything about her friend providing an alleged alibi for a friend in 1982. I want you to assume that years later, in 2015, the woman is interviewed by a prosecutor and the woman admits that she has a history of extensive drug usage and had memory issues. She states that her memories are not specific. I want you to assume that during this interview, the prosecutor suggests a hypothetical of the woman's friend providing an alibi for another friend and the woman being interviewed agrees with the prosecutor that it is something the friend may have done. I want you to assume the woman also admits to having watched a fictional movie related to the hypothetical that the prosecutor presented. Do the factors you've discussed with us and the research you've done have relevance to that hypothetical? Yes. Please explain. First of all, again, you have a very, very long period of time. You have examples of post-event suggestion. In this particular uh, hypothetical, um, a piece of post-event suggestion is a hypothetical that is being presented to this individual. And those hypotheticals can contaminate people. There is actually some scientific work that shows that presenting people with hypotheticals can get individuals to believe that they remember that hypothetical information and, and, and to not remember that it was only a hypothetical. Um, as for the chronic uh, drug use, um, I, I'm not sure I can say much about the chronic drug use, but I do know something about uh, the effects of uh, cannabis and marijuana. We published a paper on cannabis and the uh, extent to which people who are under the influence of marijuana 
are or are not more susceptible to contamination, and that, and we found in this work published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that that is the case, that people are somewhat more susceptible to picking up post-event suggestion um, if they're under the influence of marijuana. In a situation there, where there's a long length of time between events, such as 15 or 30 years, and there is a lot of post-event information, media, movies, those, those kind of things, would that create a danger for the existence of false memories? Yes, it would. Um, lots of post-event suggestion can contaminate the memory of lots of people. Can a person's bias impact their memory? Uh, yes, bias can impact memory. I, I believe I gave an example of that yesterday in my testimony talking about uh, some of the work um, where um, conservative Republicans would, were more likely to, to accept a suggestion that made a liberal Democrat, President uh, Obama, look bad, and they were somewhat less um, susceptible to contamination that made the more conservative Republican George Bush look bad. So it, that's an example of how your, your biases or predispositions can, can influence the likelihood you'll accept post-event information. In, in conclusion, if multiple per people report similar memories when questioned by the same person, can there still be the potential for false memories? Uh, absolutely. If, if, if people, um, if multiple people are exposed to suggestion, uh, you can get those multiple people to, to all give the same wrong answer. Um, and you see another example of that in uh, the Innocence Project. Uh, data, They're the Innocence Project in New York, which has uh, gathered information on um, over 350 people who have been convicted of crimes that they didn't do. DNA testing eventually was done and uh, declared that these individuals were actually innocent. They had spent 5, 10, 15, or sometimes more years in prison, and in a number of those cases, well, faulty human memory was a major cause of those wrongful convictions, and in a number of them, there are multiple people with faulty memories. Court's indulgence, please. Yes. Dr. Uh, Mr. DeGarren um, suggested a, a couple of questions or, or better explanations. What's memory contamination? Um, memory contamination it just refers to the, uh, maybe another word is pollution, that, that in information can become available uh, that can distort or, or change a person's memory. And contaminate is just a, a, another word to describe that process. And if verbal communications are the basis of memory, is that the sort of memory event that makes things potentially more malleable? Uh, the information at the time of some initial event could be visual, as when people see an auto accident, or it could be verbal as when people have a conversation, or it could take other forms, and 
the, the, the basic laws of memory, that it fades over time, that it's more susceptible to contamination with a long passage of time would be true for verbal information, visual information, and other forms of information that we might be exposed to. Thank you, Doctor. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Cross-examination. I have a few questions. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Doctor, would you agree that as a witness on cross-examination that you're here to answer the questions that are asked and not necessarily state other things you might want to advise the jury of during my questions? You understand that, right? Objection to the form of the question. Overall. Well, I will answer the questions, but I may need to explain things to give a complete answer since um, I'm supposed to be telling the truth and the whole truth. Right. So here's my question, doctor. You understand that Mr. Chesnoff is going to have a chance to get up here on redirect, and he's going to be able to question you on areas. You're aware of that, correct? Yes. So what I'm asking from you is, Will you agree that to the best of your ability, you will answer only the question that I ask? I'll try to if I feel that it won't be misleading to not fully explain it. So what you're telling me is, is instead of answering the questions I ask, you're indicating right now that your position in this is going to be, you're going to assess my questions and whether you think those questions are in your mind fair and then you will maybe answer them or maybe add things that you choose to put in that are not responsive to my questions. Is that what you're telling us? No, that's not what I'm telling you. Okay. Um, doctor, in the last 40 years, you've testified in court almost 300 times, right? Approximately 300 times, yes. You've got more courtroom experience than I do, and you're probably pulling in on Mr. DeGaron. Uh, uh, well, uh, 300, approximately 300 trials in something like 40 years. I, I'm not sure how young, whether you were in the womb when I started. I just don't know. God, I wish. I wish. Okay. I wish. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Loftus, have you and I met before? I don't recall. It's possible. My mom always told me I was very memorable, but... I guess not. Um, do, you, do you recall that uh, you testified in a case in 2012, People versus Jackson? That was a murder trial that I prosecuted in Torrance in front of the Honorable Mark Arnold. You came to Torrance and testified. Do you recall that? Uh, I do remember, I do believe I remember testifying in, in Torrance on occasion, but I'm sorry if I didn't recognize you with your mask and because disguises do interfere with face recognition. Right. That's an area that you testify to frequently in your eyewitness identification work, correct? Well, occasionally on, on the effects of disguises, yes. So, <clears throat> speaking of uh, disguises, I, I did give uh, permission to this, uh, this witness for um, reasons I need not divulge uh, that she uh, be allowed to testify at this time without wearing a mask. So, uh, just so that everyone understands that we do have a procedure in the the court, uh, I can make an exception for. Does this help? Do you, do you recognize me now or no? Well, I'm, 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 I, I don't didn't want make to an exception for you, you Mr. I just, I just, I just took it off for one <laughs> second here. So, ma'am, the Jackson case involved a, if you recall, a CIA code clerk who was murdered, a female, and found in the trunk of her car near Dockweiler Beach. Does that refresh your memory at all? I, I'm not sure. It was, seems like this was nine years ago. And sure. I'm... Do you remember, ma'am, there was a key witness who was the eight-year-old son of the victim and the stepson of the defendant, and the defense attorney was Gary Wagotsky. He had you uh, work on the case. Do you remember that at all? Um, it's, it's kind of vaguely familiar. Um, but even bringing up those facts, it really 
doesn't trigger any stronger memory for you? Uh, if I thought about it a little more, I might be able to dredge up some details. Right, and even though it's been a long time, by thinking about it and dredging up more detail, that wouldn't make your memories any less valid, correct? Um, well, if I dredged up a detail that was accurate, that, that would be fine, but if I dredged up details that were not right. accurate, um, it might not be a fully but, accurate memory. Right, but don't people all the time in their daily lives, don't they constantly dredge up older memories for use in things that go with their work, in their personal life, and just kind of living? Isn't that what human beings do? Yes. So I want to ask, Mr. Chesnoff spent a whole lot of time, um, I think more than half your testimony, going over your CV. And I must tell you, do you know how many pages this thing is? Well, I, I have a copy right here, and I, it's 46 pages. This is longer than the Bible or World <laughs> War and Peace. Well, thank you. You've got every award in here. The only thing I didn't see was that you'd been knighted by the Queen. I mean, you've got a lot of awards here, right? Is that keep correct? it to uh, Mr. Lewin. You're free to ask questions. I suppose you can say correct at the end of it. But, sure. Uh, we'll do. <clears throat> um, Ma'am, how many pages of this resume are dedicated to the different awards that you've had? Is it? I don't need you to count. It's pretty. It's pretty Pretty significant amount, correct? Uh, well, most of my CV is uh, the uh, listing of the publications, the, the 20 some odd books and 600 some odd articles, and that takes up most of the pages. And it I'm may be that there are two pages uh, or two or three pages uh, that have to do with awards that I've been honored with in my career. That's what most people put into right. a CV. Right, and, and I'm going to go back to this later, but there's going to be no awards for any organizations associated with the Me Too movement. Is that correct? Well, we'll see. Uh, well, none so far, right? No, not so far, no. <laughs> and in fact, according to your brother Robert in his interview in 2021 in a profile you cooperated with by Rachel uh, Aviv from New York Magazine, your brother said that New Yorker. New Yorker. Did I see New York Magazine? No, I think it was New York Magazine. New York. Oh, it was New York. Oh, I'm glad you remember. Um, it was a long profile on you, correct? Yes. And one you cooperated with, correct? Uh, yes. Even allowing your family members to be interviewed, correct? Well, they they participated at their own, um, you know, willingly. Well, I, <laughs> I didn't allow or disallow. Well, they 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 participated in that New Yorker profile. So, doctor, I would assume that you were aware for that New Yorker profile that your brother was going to be interviewed, correct? It wasn't over your objection. No, you're, that's correct. Okay. And your brother basically said that um, you are so unpopular with the Me Too movement that, in essence, you're on their most wanted list with the picture, your picture at their uh, headquarters. Is that about synopsis of what he said? Uh, he, he made a joke to that effect, yes. He made a joke. Uh, are you saying that that's not correct? Well, I, it, it, I don't think he knows if it's correct or not, and I certainly don't know if it's correct or not. I believe it was a joke that well, he made. You've been met with protests around the country for individuals from the Me Too movement who have a problem with some of the things you've said and some of the rapist and child molesters that you've testified for. Is that correct? Um, certainly, people have um, been distressed with some of the unpopular people whose cases I may have consulted on or actually testified in. It has distressed some people. Right, when you say distressed, distressed to the point of, in essence, having lectures canceled for you at prestigious universities because of student and faculty uh, upset, is that correct? Uh, I did have uh, a lecture canceled. Uh, I don't have a full explanation why after I testified for somebody who was unpopular. That was New York University and they have not given a full explanation for why they canceled the lecture. And, but that's your understanding, correct? That occurred right after you testified for Harvey Weinstein, correct? It actually occurred the day before. Oh, okay. And, and by the way, doctor, 
someone with your scientific background, your mathematics degree, your degrees from Stanford, circumstantially, you connect the two events, correct? Uh, yes, without any information from NYU, I did connect the two events because someone uh, inside would later report that something like that had happened, that some students or someone got upset that I would dare to testify for someone who's unpopular. Right, dare to testify for someone who's unpopular for a whole lot of money, correct? Uh, well, it was not a whole lot of money. Really, weren't you making at that time $600 an hour, and which is six grand per day plus expenses? Um, I made an arrangement uh, in that particular case to set a particular fee, only a portion of which was actually paid. Well, okay, so what was the fee arrangement you agreed to? How much did you agree to testify for? Uh, I agreed to um, provide expert testimony for the defense. Uh, I, w I was away from my office for four days, and I agreed to a fee of $14,000. And, and ma'am, no one forced you to take that case, correct? I wasn't forced to, no. You could have said, you know what, um, I don't want to testify for Mr. Weinstein, correct? Objection, Your Honor. I don't think she testified for Mr. Weinstein. She testified as an expert in a case in a courtroom in America. I mean, so Your, Your Honor, is that a, wouldn't that be oh, a oh. speaking objection? Um, Yes, it was. I apologize, Your Honor. Got carried away. Ma'am, so let me ask you something. Do you consider yourself to be a neutral witness? Uh, I'm a scientist, and I present scientific information that the jury can choose to use uh, to inform what they have to do and decide. So let me ask you the question again. Do you consider yourself to be a neutral witness? She didn't answer the question. Well, it's crossed. You can ask it twice. Okay. I think so. Well, in fact, ma'am, when you testified at the Jackson case at page 42, lines 3 through 6, I asked you the following. Do you consider yourself to be a neutral witness? And you responded, I'm a neutral witness as far as the science. Uh, as far as the science. I'm not neutral. I'm, you know, in favor of truth. And I said, so as you sit here today, my question is, given everything that you know as you sit here, do you consider yourself to be an unbiased witness? And you responded, yes. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I agree with my former self, yes. Okay. Do you agree, ma'am, that it's, it's important for a psychologist like yourself who testifies in court not to be an advocate? Well, I think it's wise to try not to be an advocate. Um, Sometimes as a human, especially if you feel that somebody is innocent or being railroaded or being overcharged, it's, it's hard to not have feelings. Okay, so let me ask you again my question. I didn't ask you how you felt about it. Just listen to my question. Do you believe that it is important for a psychologist who is there, quote, to just talk about the science to make sure that they are not an advocate? Do you agree with that? I think that that's something to strive for, yes. And you would agree that your role as an expert witness is to be an objective educator to the jury, correct? That's something to strive for, that I strive for, yes. Let me ask you, if I were to say to you, as you sit here today, do you feel you're more of an advocate for the defense than you are an objective educator? No. So you believe that in total, you are not an advocate. You are simply here to impart the unbiased, neutral truth. Is that correct? Scientific information to the jury that may assist them in uh, thinking about the, f the facts of this case and arriving at the decision that is theirs to make. Ma'am, have you ever discussed this issue in the past as to whether you believe that a psychologist should act as an advocate for the defense or as an impartial uh, educator? I I believe I wrote an article about that dilemma in, in, in the 1980s. I want to read the following quote, and I want you to tell me if you're aware of who said this. Should a psychologist in a court of law act as an advocate for the defense or an impartial educator? My answer to that question, if I'm completely honest, is both. Who said that? Uh, you'll have to show me that uh, article. 
Well, I can certainly do it, but I'm asking, do you recognize that as something that sounds like that's you? Well, I, you'll have to show me. No, the... ma'am, listen to my question. The quote that I just gave, if I asked you, I said that quote, is that a quote that you agree with? Can I get a citation as to where that it, 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 It's not required, and I'll get there when I get there. I overruled it. I'd have to look at the quote to, to see if I recognize it. Ma'am, listen to my question again. I'm not asking if you recognize it. I'm going to say the following quote, and I want you to tell me if you agree with it. Should a psychologist in a court of law act as an advocate for the defense or an impartial educator? My answer to that question, if I'm completely honest, is both. Do you agree with that statement or not? Uh, well, I partially agree with it, but I, uh, I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to look at the quote to see the context in which that quote is uttered. Let me add a little more. If I believe a defendant is innocent, if I believe in his innocence with all my heart and soul, then I probably can't help but become an advocate of sorts. Is that something you agree with? Uh, well, that's something that sounds like something I might have said, yes. So now, if I, if I would tell you, if I want you to assume that you said that quote, does that sound like something you would have said, the entire quote? It, it sounds like something I, I might have said in the 1980s. Maybe 1991, but we'll get there. Okay. So, ma'am, isn't it true, despite what you've said, that you're neutral and unbiased, that you favor the defense side? In my experience in criminal cases, I have testified on behalf of defense, the defense typically. In civil cases, it can be either side, but that's because uh, it's usually the prosecution that has a witness who's got a memory issue. Okay, so ma'am, so if you can, this is my question. That's not what I asked you. Let me try again. I'm asking you, as you sit here, ma'am, would you agree that you favor in your testimony, in your approach, in your very being, you favor the defense side? I just don't feel I can agree with the way you're putting that. Okay. I've um, how many times, by the way, have you actually testified for the defense? Well, as I indicated on direct examination, I have consulted with the prosecution maybe five or six times. Motion to times. strike is non-responsive, non-responsive. Stricken. Uh, Ma'am, so let me just ask you, did you understand the question that I just asked you? I just want to be clear. I asked you a question, how many times have you testified for the defense? And what you answered was, you brought up the idea of how many times you consulted with the prosecution. So here's my question. Did you not understand the question I asked, or did you decide that you wanted to present information that wasn't what I was asking? I was giving a, a fuller answer and repeating testimony that I believe I gave yesterday. So a fuller answer, ma'am, can you tell me what fuller answer you would need? I asked you how many times you've testified for the defense. You agree, that calls for you to say a number. Would you agree? Uh, well, that would provide part of the story, that number, and I could give you that number. Ma'am, so listen to me. Do you understand? You're not up there to provide, quote, a story. You're up there, or a narrative. You're up there right now to answer my questions, the questions that I ask. So I just want to make sure. Is that you a question itself? Don't I'm direct the witness. I'm but sorry, Your Honor? I ask her if that's her understanding. Is that your understanding, ma'am? that you're asking questions and I'm going to answer them and I'm going to try to give an answer but I did take an oath to tell the truth and the whole truth so if I can if I need to tell the whole truth I may need to say more your honor I'm going to ask the court to instruct the witness to answer the question that I asked it's a very basic easy question that's why I started there yes listen carefully to the question and answer only the question Ma'am, how many times have you testified for the defense? For the defense? Well, I, I don't know the exact number, but maybe 150 or so, approximately. I'm, I'm... Well, in 2012, didn't you testify, ma'am, that it was 260 times at least in 100 criminal cases? Does that sound about right in 2012? In 2012, the total number of cases in which I would have testified might be about, might have been 260 if it's 300 now. Okay. And ma'am, you would agree you've testified. Well, 
refer to the doctor as doctor? Yes, please. It oh, is, certainly. It is. Be respectful. Doctor. <clears throat> uh, Ma'am, Your Honor, is I'm not using it in a disrespectful no, she's, manner. Uh, earned a doctorate. You should address her as doctor. M more than happy to do that. Yes, thank you. Doctor, you've testified only one time for the prosecution, correct? That's correct. Now, I want to ask you, do you agree that when you testify that you try to do more than just educate jurors on memory and eyewitness issues? Do you agree that you try to do more than that? You're not just answering questions. You're trying to set a narrative for the jury. Is that right? I, I'm not sure if I agree with that. I, I'm imparting scientific information for them to use. Did you tell in 2010 to Orange Coast Magazine, Patrick Kiger, that in many of your early cases, you went, quote, beyond simply attempting to educate judges and jurors about the impre imprecision of the memory process, as she describes in, and you name a book, she also vetted prosecution witnesses' statements and testimony, looking for incongruities that might indicate that authorities had contaminated their memories with information or pressured them to alter their recollections. Did you say that? I don't remember saying that, but that is certainly what I do in many cases, review materials and look uh, to see if there are inconsistencies in, in, or changes in what people are remembering. That's, that's what I do. Right, and you're doing it from the context, ma'am. You're not just coming in to testify about memory. You're coming in and you're consulting with these defense lawyers. By these defense lawyers, I don't mean the ones here I'm saying whenever you take a criminal case. You're consulting with the defense lawyers and you're trying to help them with a strategy so that their client is not convicted, correct? I, I don't agree with that description of it. I, I do examine um, materials that are sent to me for review and I look to see if there are changes in, in people's stories and what might contribute to those changes. Ma'am, when I notice, and I assume you're trained to do this, when I ask you a question, I notice that you will then turn and look directly at the jury, and I notice that you will use, make gestures with your hands, et cetera. Is that a part of your training that you've learned, that you want to turn away from the person questioning, you want to look directly at the jurors because they're your audience? Is that something you've learned over your time? I it's just my custom to speak to the jury because it's the jury that is supposed to be receiving this information. Right, ma'am, but you would agree that generally when people are having an exchange of information, you've been many, many courtrooms and seen many witnesses testify, agree? Uh, well, approximately 300 trials, right. yes. And ma'am, you would agree that most of the time when a witness is on the stand, they're actually looking at the person that's asking them questions. Would you agree? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure that happens often, yes. Okay. And but, because it's, the, it's natural to look at the person who's asking the question. Right. And right. this is a little bit of an artificial situation. Right. Well, it's artif it, when you say artificial, what it, what it is is exactly, you tell me, you're looking at those jurors because you have been taught and you have learned that you want to face, as an expert, you want to look over at that jury, you want to stare them right in the eye, you want to use hand gestures, because you believe that that enhances your credibility. Is that correct? I, I, I don't know. I hadn't even thought of it that way. As a psychologist who deals with the way people interact, you're telling me that what I've just pointed out is something that's never occurred to you? No, it has occurred to me that it, it is helpful to communicate directly to the jury, and that's why I try to direct my answers to them. Ma'am, you testified that you have a policy of not speaking to prosecutors. Is that correct? Mr. Lewin, please address the witnesses, doctor. Oh, I'm, I apologize, Your Honor. Again, it's, it, it is a habit for all witnesses, as the court is aware. But, I'll, but I'll, I'll do my best. It's not intentional. Doctor, you testified that you have a policy of not speaking to prosecutors. Is that correct? Right, you just did in, in direct with Mr. Chesnoff. It, it's not something I ever remember doing. Well, and you said, ma'am, well, let me, you explain why, but I want to ask you right now, tell me why is that your policy or your procedure? I, I don't, I, I don't know if that I
decision not to speak with me, correct? I, I know a great deal about your interviewing because of interviews you did in this case in 2015 and 16. So, so ma'am, when you were answering the questions by Mr. Chesnoff and he asked you why you didn't speak with me, did you mention any of the factors you just said right now? Well, I didn't want to insult you, but you're, you're asking me further questions that require this information. So, so you're saying that as you sat up there, you shaped your answers because you were concerned that um, in explaining why you wouldn't speak to me in a professional relationship that I would be insulted and you wanted to spare my feelings? Is that your testimony? Well, the, the first and foremost reason is I, I don't recall ever speaking with the prosecutor. Well, so uh, so it, it's not in, in, in 40 years of, of this and maybe 150 criminal cases, I don't recall ever doing it. So I, I, I presented this uh, dilemma to the attorneys and, and it, it didn't seem as if it was required and it, it could be done during examination, cross-examination. Ma'am, isn't it true that prior to your testimony in 2012, you had a phone conversation with myself and Mr. Wagotsky, the defense attorney, over the phone. I don't recall that at all. Are you saying that didn't happen, ma'am, or are you no, just saying might, you don't recall? No, I don't recall that. Um, let me ask you something. Given the research you've done on me, given what you've studied, et cetera, do you think I'm someone that you, given what you do, would remember or no? I, I'm sorry that I don't remember you. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm just trying to, to hurt your feelings. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, in, I'm, I'm not insulted at all. I'm just trying to understand, ma'am, when you're saying your answers of you don't recall having any conversation with any prosecutor before a case in 50 years. I'm just trying to understand why you don't remember a conversation from it's only 2012, but you have no memory of it. No, but but there have been many, many, many cases since okay. then. So, um, ma'am, have you ever heard? I'm sorry, doctor, excuse me. Have you ever heard the phrase that memory is not like a tape recorder or video recorder, that you can't just turn it on and play it back? Yes. In fact, that's one of the main tenets of your field of study. Is that correct? Well, well that's, that's something that I and many other scientists in right. my field uh, say when they talk right. about memory. Right. Mr. Chesnoff, he was the first one to bring that concept up during your direct examination. Do you recall that? Uh, I don't specifically, but I would have, I would have probably discussed right, that right. with him in right. some it, of our meetings. Right. Did you give him a list of questions to ask you at all, ma'am? Uh, doctor, excuse me. D did I give him a list yeah. of questions? Did you ever give him any questions to ask you? Mr. Chesnoff, you should ask me this. Mr. Chesnoff, you should bring this issue up. Did you do that at all? Uh, I did. Um, give the attorneys some prior testimony that I had given in other cases. So this, again, let me ask the question again. Did you at any point in time suggest to Mr. Chesnoff, either by email, in person, indirectly say, listen, here's some questions you might want to ask me? Well, I just answered that question. I did provide some samples of, of uh, prior testimony that, that might be useful to the well, defense attorney. So in, in, if you want to call that a suggestion, it's, it's a... Well, you first answered my question by saying you gave him copies of prior transcripts. Now you've said you gave him samples. Well, am, I... Am I, let me finish, ma'am, doctor, excuse me. Am I correct in assuming that when you say samples, what you meant by that is you gave him prior transcripts that had questions that you believed would make you most effective to the jury based on your 300 cases that you testified in, correct? No, that's not correct. Um, 
let me ask you, have you pretty much used the quote that memory is not like a tape recorder or a video recorder, you can't just turn it on and play it back? Have you pretty much used that in almost every criminal trial you've ever testified in? I have said that frequently in, in court testimony, in writing, and in speeches. I don't know if it's every criminal trial because the issue might not have come up, but I've so, said it frequently. So if I were to say to you, doctor, that I've reviewed dozens of your transcripts and that it comes up in just about every single time you testify, would that surprise you or would you think that's inaccurate? Well, I. I take your word for it. I haven't done that analysis myself, but since it's something I frequently say, I would not be surprised if it's frequently mentioned. In fact, you, you used that example in the Harvey Weinstein rape trial where you just testified, correct? Uh, but th that was testimony about memory, and I probably would have said that, yes. In fact, I want to ask you in the Jackson case, did you say the following? What does that mean, the malleability of human memory? Well, memory doesn't work like a videotape recorder. You don't just record it. Rather, it's a constructive process, and it can be influenced by other things that happen to a person. So memories can change, and that's what we refer to the malleability of memory. That's at the Jackson transcript, page 11, lines 13 through 17. Does that sound like something that you said? It does, yes. Now. The point of that expression is that, in essence, our memories cannot just be played back. Is that correct? Yes. And that because of that, they can be mistaken or they can be either intentionally or unintentionally manipulated. Would you agree? Yes. And one of the areas that you've testified about previously involves the issues of how witnesses can be improperly affected by false memories that are created or suggested by leading information provided by law enforcement officers. Is that correct? Yes. And in fact, you pointed out that a big problem in a lot in assessing that issue is that in your experience, many of these interviews are untaped. Is that right? Um, many of the interviews are not recorded, and so you don't know what happened. And you don't know exactly what the questions are. Right, and you would agree, doctor, that if you're assessing whether or not there's been improper influence, et cetera, during an interview, you can't get that by simply someone recalling what was said. You need to actually listen and watch the interview yourself. Is that correct? Well, that's helpful if you have that recording, yes. And your possession, your, I'm sorry, your, your position has been for that reason, that these interviews need to be tape recorded, correct? That in essence, the tape recorder, the video recorder is our friend because it records what people said so that there's no dispute of what actually happened. Would you agree? I agree, that's a good idea. Ma'am, given your staunch advocacy for taping, have you yourself- have at, been, your, uh, Doctor. What? You oh, uh, okay. Doctor, yes. Yes. Yeah. Doctor, yeah. Well, write it down in your picture. Yeah. Well, I'm not. The, the problem is, and I apologize, Your Honor, when I, I looked at my questions where I'm going, but in the end, doing this 30 years, I go with ma'am and sir most of the time. So, yep. again, I, I apologize, Doctor. You are absolutely an incredibly accomplished uh, individual. There is no, in my questioning, in no way do I minimize your academic success, et cetera. So, if I'm slipping up calling you ma'am, it's not because you haven't earned the title doctor. I might disagree with some of your findings, so please don't take offense, and I'll try to do better. Let's, uh, <clears throat> we need to take our recess. Yes, well, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. Yes, put that back on, thanks.